Hello, friends from all around the world. Ryan Day here, and I'm always blessed to be able to spend this time with you as we dive into the Word of God each and every week here on the 3 ABN Worship Hour. This week uh, is not going to uh, disappoint because we're going to be diving deep into God's Word once more to perhaps maybe discover something, consider something that we never have considered before uh, when it comes to the topic of Death. Now, I know that seems to be a topic that many people don't want to discuss. They say, Ryan, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a topic that's scary. It's a topic that it, it, it brings anxiety into my heart and mind. Or maybe there's someone saying, well, we talk about this all the time, or I already know all that there needs to know about the topic of death. Well, there is someone that's going to watch this presentation uh, that needs to hear it for the very first time. Or maybe someone who has heard this presentation before, but needs to rediscover that truth or needs to hear it from a different perspective. The title of today's message is The Death Challenge. Notice this, part one, because this is one of, a part one of two. There's going to be two parts to this subject. Today, we're going to deal with answering the general questions surrounding what the Bible teaches about death. Okay, We're going to look at uh, you know, all of the different aspects in Scripture of what is the soul, what is the spirit, and you know, where do we go when we die, if anywhere, and what does the Bible say about this subject? And then in part two, uh, in, in part two which is going to come in the future, uh, we're going to look at all of the challenging uh, passages, scriptures that many people use to try to disprove what I'm talking about today, or they try to use it to support their position on death. We're going to look at many of those different challenging texts. What has sparked this subject and brought it into my heart and mind today to present it to you is we are seeing as we get closer and closer to the second coming of Jesus, we're seeing this issue come up more and more, especially within the Christian communities. Uh, recently, uh, Angel Studios just released, uh, 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 I think, a, a movie or a film uh, entitled After Death. And so that's a big deal. Uh, if you go watch the trailer, which I'm not necessarily promoting it, I'm just simply acknowledging the fact that this particular uh, series or movie is out there, film is out there for people to... Get, be given a perspective on what uh, happens to you when you die. I believe that the perspective that is shared within that, uh, that film or that series is, of course, not entirely accurate. And so um, I want to give you what I believe to be the biblical answer as to what happens to us when we die. And as we get toward the end of this message and set up for part two, we will ask the question, well, why is it important that we need to know the truth about death? So let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us. And we're going to launch right into this subject. We're going to learn together and grow together in uh, asking the question and answering the question, what does the Bible teach about death? And we're going to issue it some challenges along the way. So let us bow our heads and let's go to the Lord in prayer right now. Our Father in heaven, we praise you and thank you, Lord, for who you are. You are worthy to be praised. You are worthy to be worshiped. And Lord, each and every time we have an opportunity here on the 3 ABN Worship Hour, we want to take time to, again, uh, just give attention to what your word actually says and to worship you as your word says in spirit and in truth, to refocus our attention and sharpen our focus on what the scriptures actually teach uh, in whatever given subject or topic it is that we're studying. And so, Father, I pray that you'll lead and guide us at this time and that this message will be a tremendous blessing to every single person that watches. And even those, Lord, who may have never heard this before, may it be a blessing to them and may eyes be open to what your word actually teaches. We give this time to you and we ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. In fact, I want to encourage you, my friends, to take this message and share it. If you're watching this on YouTube, click the share button, copy that link, send it to as many people as possible through email. If you're watching it on your phone, copy that link, text it, send it out to as many people as possible. If you're watching this on 3ABN Plus or wherever you're hearing or seeing this from, share it, share it, share it, because there's probably someone out there that needs to hear this truth. The question we're asking is, after death, what? Or what happens to us at the point of death? And of course, the title is The Death Challenge, Part 1. I'm extending a challenge, and you'll hear those challenges as we go through uh, this series of study, okay? So where our journey is going to start in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. One, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. And now, while you guys are turning in your Bibles to that text, uh, I want to just kind of set this up by giving a quick testimony. I have been to 
what seems to be maybe dozens, maybe even hundreds of funerals in my lifetime. In fact, I absolutely despise funerals. It's, it's one of the things that I don't think anyone likes. I've never met anyone who says, oh man, I, I love funerals. I can't wait to go to that funeral tomorrow. It, it's, it, obviously, it's a very serious subject we're talking about. And the very nature of a funeral is very sad. It's very, it, it's, it's, it's heartfelt. Your heart goes out to those people who have lost loved ones, who have lost friends. And you know what? If you have never experienced the loss of a loved one or a loss of a friend or family member or someone you care about, um, there will come a time when you will. And it is one of the hardest, most difficult things to ever have to endure in this life. And it actually helps you to check the pulse on, on this life that you're living because it helps to bring to you the reality Death itself helps to bring to us the reality that there is a sin problem and that we hopefully one day with our trust in Christ and our faith in Him will overcome death through the man, the person, Jesus Christ, because Christ is the only person who has ever defeated death and it is through Him that we also have the opportunity to defeat death. But yet the enemy wants us to believe something about death that is not entirely accurate. And it is at many of these funerals that I have heard testimonies that I've heard, uh, sermons given that have communicated what I have come to believe is not the truth about death. And then there's a danger in believing what most people today believe in regards of the afterlife or what happens to us when we die. Perhaps you go to a funeral and you hear at this funeral that as my, I'll give an example, my grandmother passed away many years ago. And as the preacher gets up to preach and to give the message for her uh, at her sermon or, or at her funeral, a sermon at her funeral, uh, it's very interesting that uh, like many other pastors that I've heard in the past, uh, he gets up and says, you know, folks, uh, uh, Mrs. Day has passed on. And, and yes, it is a sad day indeed. And of course, the family members are crying and weeping on the front row. And, and he's, a try, he's trying his best to bring comfort to their hearts in the best way that he can. And many ministers do that by saying the following, or at least a version of the following words. They'll say something like, I know that Miss Day, yes, has left us and, and it's a very sad day. And, 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 uh, and I know tears are going to be shed and I know much sorrow and pain will come of her departure. But make no mistake, friends. And of course, the minister that was at my grandmother's uh, funeral was a Pentecostal minister. So he brought it with, with conviction and power and boldness. And he said, uh, friends, but I'm here to tell you in Jesus name that uh, sister day is in heaven today. And she's up in glory land and, and she's walking those streets of God. And she's saying to us down here, don't cry over me because I'm in a better place. Hallelujah. And again, the idea is, is that while grandma's body is with us today, clearly visible in this casket, grandma day, her spirit, her soul has went on. And it has now uh, transcended this life and it's went on to uh, the presence of God where Grandma Day, in a very, very aware, very uh, 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 awakened spiritual state, is there basking in the presence and the glory and the, the loveliness of heaven and God's presence where she's looking down upon us now and she's watching over us from the heavenly courts above as she is in a better place and she's in the presence of God. In other words, the idea is that while she has died and her body is here, her soul or her spirit, her spiritual being, her ghost has now went on to be with God. And of course, uh, you'll never hear anyone say anything like, well, that person who died, they went to hell. It's interesting how almost people naturally assume that when a person dies, they somehow immediately end, in the, end up in the presence of God. And if you try to even communicate, which I never would, I'm, I'm not the minister or a person to ever try to communicate or, or try to decide someone's fate. We should never do that. The Bible makes it clear that we are not anyone's judge. We are not to determine who goes to heaven or who goes to hell or where they're going to end up. But it's interesting that almost all people naturally assume that their dead loved ones and their friends end up in heaven immediately when they die. But you'll never hear anyone say, oh yeah, that person didn't live a godly life. They're in the, they're in the depths of hell burning now forever and ever. And I only say that because if you assume that someone 
one has went down to the bad place, then you're considered our judge. Don't judge them. Don't be a judge. You're not God. But yet we also often try to play the role of God by presumptuously thinking that someone has made it to heaven based off of maybe a, a false sense of faith that you have in something that's actually not grounded in Scripture. I know all that I've said in the opening moments of this presentation it's probably worked some people up who will hear this message for the first time today and you're probably saying, I, I already disagree with you, Ryan, and I'm not really liking where you're going with this. But I want to challenge you. Death challenge part one. Walk with me through the scriptures. Take a journey with me. Let's investigate what happens to us when we die and why it's important that we know this truth today. I want to start in Genesis 3, as you should be there in your Bibles. And Genesis 3 and verse 1 says the following. It says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. So she's acknowledging in response to the serpent, which we know the serpent to be none other than the devil himself. Eve is responding to the serpent. She's saying, no, 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 no. God has made it clear that it, we can eat of all, we have the freedom to eat of all these other trees in the garden. But the day that we eat of that one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, if we pluck from that tree and eat it, then in that day we will die. We will experience death. But what was the response of the serpent? That age-old response that even many Christians today have rooted and grounded their belief in. And that is, what did he say to her in verse 4? Genesis chapter 3 verse 4. You shall not surely die. You see, the response of the devil there to Eve, that you shall not surely die, is the opposite of what God had said would be the result of their sin. And we know very clearly that in the Bible, Romans chapter 6, verse 23 tells us that the wages or the cost, the, the consequences of a continued life of sin is death. But what is the opposite of death according to that scripture? Eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. But what's interesting is you take that very text in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, which gives you two opposing views, this idea that the consequences of sin is, is death, which means an end of life. And then, of course, the opposite of that, meaning you're, you're putting your faith in Christ, you're seeking Christ, you're serving Christ. If you do that and you put your full faith and surrender your life to Him, that you will have the opposite of the consequences of sin. You will have the beautiful reward of eternal life in Christ Jesus. But what's interesting is many Christians today have jumped on the serpent bandwagon in their belief of death. They believe what the serpent believed. What did he say to Eve? God said, you're going to die. Eve said, or the devil said, no, 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 you're not, you're not really going to die. That's what most Christians believe today about death, my friends. They believe this twisted view of immortality of the soul or immortality of the human spirit as they say. And here in a moment, we're going to jump into what is the soul, what is the spirit. But I just want to lay the groundwork here. The idea that, that you will have eternal life. In fact, I passed by, and I have a note here on, on, on my iPad here. I passed by a church sign. I actually have a picture of it. I know you can't see it here, but it's right here on my iPad. There's a picture here I took of a church sign that I passed by. And I, and I like to look at church signs when I, when I drive by a church. It's cool to have or to see the various messages or encouraging text or whatever they'll have on there or, or the funny little messages that they might have on their sign. But this particular sign, I've seen it in multiple places as I've driven across this nation and across the world. Uh, preaching the gospel and ministering to others in different states and different communities. I've seen these words on multiple church signs. And what did this church sign say? It says, you will live forever. The question is, where? And that, my friends, is the best description of what most Christians today believe. I even grew up believing that. This idea that actually you do live forever. 
It just depends on which place you live forever. If you die, even though your body expires, according to, again, popular Christianity and, and, and even the occult world and even the Hollywood world, the idea is, is that even though your body might expire and die, you, your spirit, your soul, your ghost, or the spiritual person or apparitions deep inside your body is going to somehow be liberated from the body at the point of death after you've taken your last breath, and it's going to find itself eventually in the presence of God forever or in the presence of the bad place, hell, burning fire where, you're, where your soul is being you know, evenly roasted and toasted and burned for all ceaseless ages to come. Uh, we'll, we'll probably come back and have a topic on hell in the near future, but that's not today's topic. I want to challenge you on that thinking. Is that what the Bible teaches? And I, some of, I know some of you are probably screaming into your phone screens or you're screaming into your television screen or, or your computer screen. And some of you are probably on right now. You, you just, you've got that nervous energy and you've got to type in a message right now. And I actually encourage you, good or bad, to type in those messages because the more you comment on YouTube or comment, it just helps get, tap into the algorithm and help us to get our message out there better. And we want to get the message of the truth out there. But some of you might be typing and saying, I disagree with this. I don't agree with you, Ryan. I disagree with what you're saying. I believe that when you die, your soul, your spirit, it goes to be with God or it goes to hell for all ceaseless ages. I'm going to say it here and boldly tell you that is not what the Bible teaches. At least not in the traditional way that Christianity has been led to believe it for many, 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 many years. What is the soul? What is the spirit? If you don't answer those questions accurately, it will lead you to a wrong conclusion on what happens to you at the point of death and therefore potentially set you up for tremendous detrimental deception in these last days. What is the soul? What is the spirit? We're going to start there. Because I could pull out text right now. You could give me all of your texts. I know somebody right now is saying, oh, but the Bible says when you're absent from the body, you're present with the Lord. Does it really say that? Oh, I know it's in there somewhere. We're going to look at that text in part two. I know someone right now is saying, oh, uh, surely it does because Jesus promised that day. Uh, he promised the thief that, that uh, he would be with him in paradise. So, yes, Ryan, when you die, you must go to heaven because he was with Jesus in paradise after he died. Is that what the Bible says? You say, oh, I know what's in there. We're going to investigate that text too in part two. There may be various other texts. Well, I know Jesus went to hell and preached to the spirits in prison. Or, or, or I, I know that there's a, there's a scripture in there somewhere where Samuel the prophet's dead ghostly body or spirit was, was resurrected and, and, and Saul spoke to him. Uh, they have all of these theories and all these texts that they try to use. Or the most famous one, and we're going to talk about this one. What about the story of the rich man and Lazarus? Surely when he died, his spirit went to heaven. And of course, the rich man, he went to hell and, and their spirits were we're in different places. How do you disprove that, Ryan? It clearly says it. I'm going to tell you, I'm challenging you, stick out this teaching on part one and, and, and I challenge you to stick it out through part two. I'm going to prove to you through the Bible that many people have been led to have a, a, a different violating belief. In other words, a violating belief, meaning a, an, a, an inaccurate belief or an inaccurate conclusion on those particular texts, and that if we study to show ourselves approved, we'll see that the Bible is not actually teaching us that at the point of death we have a ghost or a spiritual, you know, clear, transparent spiritual being that ends up in the immediate presence of God or in the immediate presence of hell. That is not what the Bible teaches. And it all is rooted and grounded in how or what you believe in the soul and the spirit. If you can understand clearly what is a soul, and what is a spirit? And you land that plane on the right answer. And you land your plane on the right conclusion as to what is a soul and what is a spirit. Then the rest of the Bible text begin to make very, very, very much sense.
So there's the question. What is the soul? What is the spirit? Now we go to Genesis chapter 2. We were just in Genesis 3. Let's go back one chapter, Genesis chapter 2, and we're going to read verse 7. This is probably one of our thesis texts for this entire series. Genesis chapters 2 and verse 7. This is where God is forming Adam's body. Remember, he's creating Adam from the dust of the ground, and then, but Adam is still not a living being yet. He was just a body. He was just a corpse. But something had to be added to that corpse or added to that body in order for him to become a living being. So let's read that. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. What does the Bible say? It says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So what can we conclude from this text here? This is a strong foundational text. In order to understand death, we need to go back to the beginning and understand life. In other words, in order to understand how we're taken out of this world, it helps us to first go back and examine how we're brought into this world. So many people misunderstand how we're taken out of this world because they have a misunderstanding of how we were brought into this world. And so we're investigating that now. What is a soul? What is a spirit? Well, according to this text... In order for Adam to have became or become a living soul, he had to have two elements brought together. His body, which God created from the dust or the dirt of the ground. But he, was, he still, was he alive at that point when God created him? No. What did Jesus have to do? <sighs> Breathe the breath of life into that body in order for him to become a living soul. So the body plus the breath equals a living soul. Did you catch that? Body plus breath, according to the Bible. And please, I know some of you are, I've heard, I was talking to a gentleman uh, with this not too many years ago, and I heard someone, they, they told me, they, I was talking to this gentleman, he said to me, he said, well, well, Ryan, we're triune beings. And I didn't really understand what he said, what he meant by that at first until he explained it. And, and I find out that most Christians actually believe some version of this uh, theory or this ideology. And that's, he said, we're triune spirits or we're triune beings. We are, we are mind, body, and spirit. And so his idea was that, that those three elements are not necessarily the same, but we have them. And therefore, when a person dies, the spiritual being, which we don't understand fully, it goes on to be with God. And so he was rejecting my idea of, of talking about what happens to us when we die. He rejected my idea and settled on this very popular evangelical belief, which is, yeah, 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 when you die, you know, you're your spiritual man, your ghost, your spirit, your soul, which they use those words interchangeably, soul, spirit, ghost, the human ghost, the human spirit, the human soul. It goes on and it goes into God's presence of which it's then decided whether or not that person is accepted in eternal life with God or eternal life in the bad place with the devils and the minions and all the horrible people that are or poor, horrible demons that, that somehow are in charge of heaven. And we're again, hell is another topic, but I just want to make this very clear. According to the Bible, Adam did not wake up or become a living being until the breath of life was added. Now, uh, let's continue on and look at a couple other texts to determine what is a soul, what is a spirit. Let's go to Genesis chapter 7. Notice what it says in Genesis 7 in response to the flood in Noah's day. Remember all of those people that perished in the flood? They were the unrighteous. We would call them the wicked. They did not get on the ark. Only Noah and his family got on the ark, and they were saved. With those people who did not get on the ark, they weren't saved. And so what happened to all of them? Notice the description in Genesis chapter 7, verses 21 and 22. It says there, And all flesh died. All flesh did what? They died that moved upon the earth. Well, what does that mean? It says, all in, notice the words here, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life, of all that was in the dry land, it died. So notice we have the same confirmation in this verse that we just found in Genesis 2-7, that, uh, that when Adam became a living soul, his body was there, but the breath of life was given to him through his nostrils. That's an expression meaning... There's some kind of supernatural thing that happened in that moment that when God gave the, the, the breath of life, Adam became a living being. What is happening here in Genesis? Well, they had the breath of life in their nostrils. In other words, they had the breath of life, but when they died, that breath of life was taken. Notice in Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 22, it says, Cease ye from being man, or from man, 
whose breath, again, there's the word, notice the consistent words here, whose breath is in his nostrils for wherein he has to be accounted of. In other words, his, his, his very existence, his living status is dependent on whether or not he has this breath of life flowing through his body and through his nostrils. Now, some of us may be led to believe that we're talking about oxygen here. Yes, oxygen is important. We need it to live, but that's not what we're talking about here. The breath of life is not just oxygen. It's not some earthly element or gas that God has created for our life and our body to be sustained. No, 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 no. The breath of life is a supernatural power that can only come from God. We're going to prove that right now. Notice in, in Job chapter 27 and verse 3, we're getting somewhere. Job chapter 27 and verse 3, it says, All the while my breath is in me, but notice what he says now, and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. Now let's not let this be taken too literal here. We're not talking about literally there's a spiritual being dancing around in our nose cavity. That's not what it's talking about. We're not talking about God, kind of like a genie in a lamp. He somehow is, is now hiding in your, uh, your nose or your nostrils or your, or your nasal cavity. That's not what it's talking about. When it talks about the Spirit of God, this is not talking about the, 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 the personal being of the Godhead, the, the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about the Spirit of life. When it says the Spirit of God is in my nostrils, that's consistent with the breath of life that we have seen. In fact, that's what it says here. All the while my breath is in me and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. Notice breath and spirit is interchangeable. They're synonyms within this conversation of life and death. So spirit equals breath. Did you know that? The Bible makes this very clear. Multiple texts. In fact, I challenge you. We have a death challenge. I'm challenging you. Go do your research. You'll find that oftentimes in conversation or in, within the context of the human spirit or the human uh, uh, breath, it, it's talking about uh, spirit equals breath. It's not talking about a ghost. In fact, to tie this all up, let me, let me, let me ask you this question. When a person dies... Does their spirit return to God? Now, if you know your Bible, then the answer to that question should be, yes, Ryan, our spirit returns to God. Now, I have never met a Christian that doesn't believe that. In fact, all Christians should believe that. And the question is, why should they believe that? Because it's in the Bible. But let me ask you this question. How many times in the Bible... Does it say that when you die, your spirit returns to God? One time. One time. Only once in the entire Bible does it actually use the words, spirit returns to God in Scripture. So the idea, when you hear someone say, oh yeah, when that person died, their spirit went to be with the Lord. Where are they getting that from? Only one text in all the Bible. And that scripture is in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 in verse 7. Let's read it. What does it say in Ecclesiastes 12 verse 7? Notice the word. Notice the words used here. It says, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Now, for those of you who were screaming into the screen, probably saying, oh, I disagree with you that spirit and breath are not the same thing. Notice this text in Ecclesiastes 12, 7, which again, just to repeat myself, because re repetition is often a great learner or great teacher. This is the only text in all the Bible that actually explicitly says that when you die, your spirit returns to God. But if you look at these words in this text, it is Genesis 2, 7, in reverse. What did Genesis 2, 7 say? It, when God was bringing Adam into this world, he created his body from the dust of the ground. And then was Adam alive yet? No. Was he a living being yet? No. He wasn't a living being until what happened? He added the breath of life into his nostrils. And the question is, what is that breath of life? Did God have some type of ghost that he had already created and then he just, you know, laid the ghost in the body or he breathed this intelligent ghost into his body. No, 
not what the Bible teaches. In fact, I'll never forget years ago, uh, one of my favorite movies growing up as a kid was the, the Disney movie Hercules. There was a Disney movie that released in the late 90s called Hercules. And, and I'll never forget the scene. Hercules had to go down to Hades, the underworld, and he had to retrieve the dead spirit of his girlfriend Meg. And so he goes down to Hades and he had to go jump into this river or, or weird body of water, but it was a spiritual body where he had to jump in and he had to go retrieve her, her ghost, which was floating in this, this eternal dark abyss of an of a, of a underworld. He had to go jump in there, retrieve her, her spirit body. And of course, in, in, in kind of a translucent, almost a ghostly apparition type way, they, they depicted it as he's carrying this ghost. He goes over to her dead body and he bends down and he lays this, this, this spirit ghost into her body. And then she, guess what? Guess what happens? She, <gasps> and she wakes up. And that is how Christian, most Christians believe this. They believe exactly that way. They think that when a person dies, they're, they're intelligent, uh, aware, very thoughtful, very aware, spiritual being goes on to be with God. The Bible doesn't teach that. Because the Bible does not teach that the spirit that returns to God has intelligence or awareness. Because the spirit that returns to God is exactly what God gave when he created Adam. It's simply the breath of life. How do I know that? Ecclesiastes 12, 7. What does it say here? Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return to God who gave it. This is Genesis 2, 7 in reverse. When a person dies, the opposite of Genesis 2, 7 happens. When a person dies, what do they do? They take their last, <sighs> their last breath. But what is that breath? It's not just oxygen. It's not just a combination of gases like oxygen and CO2. There's something supernatural. You're alive. I'm alive preaching this sermon to you right now because God supernaturally in his own amazing creative way allows me to be alive to preach this sermon to you. You're alive right now with a heartbeat and a pulse watching this presentation because God allows you with his breath of life flowing through you to be a living being. But at the point when you and I expire from this planet, when it comes time for us to die, we're going to take that last breath. And when that happens, what returns to God? Your ghost is not going to come out of your body and look down and go, oh, well, that's rather interesting there's my body and oh look there's the world and no one can see me and and you end up floating up into while you're fully aware of what's going on no 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 no. the bible doesn't communicate any of that and i know even as i'm saying this there's someone right now saying but ryan there's so many people who have had these near-death experiences and have lived to tell the story how do you explain that Ryan, there's someone out there who they had 23 minutes in hell. They wrote a whole book about it. Please, Ryan, how do you explain that? How do you explain all these instances where people actually saw things while they were dead for two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, five minutes on the operating table to be able to explain all that was in the room and all that was happening and how they went to heaven and they sat in God's lap and they danced down the streets of gold holding Jesus' hand. How do you explain all of that, Ryan? We're going to bring a very credible explanation to that in part. Part two. That's why you got to come watch, come back and watch part two when it airs in the future. But what I'm telling you is we do not base truth on human experience. We do not base truth on human testimony. Yes, testimonies can be powerful. Yes, stories can be very powerful and influential. But at the end of the day, if I'm going to believe a doctrine, if I'm going to believe a truth, if I'm going to believe something, I need to see it rooted and grounded and with, with clear, clear support and evidence from God's Word. And I don't see any of that in God's Word. So what happens to you when you die? Right here, it says in Ecclesiastes 12, 7, that the spirit, that is the breath of life, returns to God who gave it. And that person ceases at that point to be a living being. In fact, the word for spirit there in Ecclesiastes 12, 7, it's the word, it's the Hebrew word ruach, which means wind, breath. Wind and breath. 
It's consistent even in the original language. You go ask any Hebrew scholar today and ask them, what does this word mean and what is this text saying? They'll tell you, oh, well, you're alive because the breath of life is throwing, flowing through you, just like what God did with Adam. And when you die, he takes that breath of life back. <laughs> you just cease to be a living being at that point. You, are no, you will never be another living being or living soul until that breath of life is rejoined back together with your body. In fact, that's where we're going next. Let's go back to Genesis 2-7 and let's make a very clear, clear, bold point here. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And then notice these words here. Man became a living soul. Did you catch that? Let me make this very clear statement. And usually when I say this at my evangelistic series publicly, and when I'm in front of people, I'll say this and I'll hear some gasp in the uh, audience. I'll say these words. You do not have a soul. And usually when I say that, they'll... <gasps> and you can hear chatter. <laughs> because we've heard all of our life, you know, uh, th oh, that brother, he sold his soul to the devil. What do they communicate when they say that? As if you have a soul, you, you possess some type of soul substance in you that, that, that you can control based on your choices or your consent. That, that, that there's some type of, of ghostly apparition deep within you that at the point of death is going to, again, with very much intelligence and awareness, go on to be in the eternal presence of one or two places. That's not what the Bible teaches. I'm challenging you. Find it for me. Show it to me. Now, you're going to go to some text that we're going to cover in the next presentation, in part two. But it actually never says in the Bible that you have a soul. You don't have a soul. You don't possess a soul. What it says is you are a soul. There's a difference between having something and being something. If I say I have a, I don't know, if I have a rocket... I know that's a horrible off the top of the head example, but I'm going to use it anyways. If I say I have a rocket, that might impress some people. They go, wow, well, where's your rocket? I want to see it. But if I walked up to you and I said, hello, I'm a rocket, you would be like, ooh, that, those are two different concepts, right? Right here in Genesis 2-7, it doesn't say that God gave Adam a living soul. It says he became, which means if you become it, that means previously to that, you were not that. Previously to that, there was no such thing as a living soul previous to those two elements coming together, body and breath. You have to have the body and the breath come together so that you can have a living soul. Let me nail that home. What is a living soul according to the Bible? What's a living soul? Body plus breath equals a living soul. If you remove the breath from the body, what are you left with? Not a soul because there's no such thing in the Bible as a dead soul. Challenging you on that. Show me in the Bible where it talks about a dead soul. It doesn't exist. The only type of soul that exists is a living soul. Because the only type of soul, the only type of soul that can exist is a living soul. Because if you put the body and the breath together, you have, he becomes, she becomes a living soul. You remove that breath of life from the body, what's left over? Nothing living, just simply a dead corpse, a dead body in which the breath of life that gave it power to live, it goes back to be with God who gave it. Now you say, Ryan, I, I hear what you're saying, but I so disagree with you. I hear what you're saying, but I, I'm, I'm still going to ride on the bandwagon of, of our soul and our spirit. It is intelligent. It is aware that my grandma's spirit's in heaven looking down on me. My, my grandpa's spirit's in heaven. My mom's spirit, my loved ones, my friend's spirit, they're all very much aware in the spirit form that I'm down here and they're up there. Or they're down there and I'm up here, however which way you believe. <laughs> my friends... And the idea of that, notice, is exactly what the devil said in the beginning. You shall not surely die. Because if you believe that the spirit never dies but lives eternal in one place or the other, then you don't believe what the Bible teaches. You believe what the devil teaches. Because the devil says you shall not surely die when God says you shall die. Death is the opposite of eternal life. And eternal life is only granted to those people 
who serve and live for God. In fact, I want to challenge you with this. Can a ghost die? If you consider a spirit a ghost, an intelligent ghostly apparition of some kind, then can the spirit die? Well, again, according to popular Christianity, no. It, it doesn't die. It just goes on to live in one of two places. In other words, it lives forever. It's immortal. Spirits are immortal according to most popular beliefs today. This idea of the immortality of the spirit, it's not biblical. The Bible says only God has immortality. Go read First and Second Timothy. And we'll hash that out in the next uh, presentation as well. Got a lot to cover in part two. I just want to make this very, 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 very clear. Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 4, it says, and you got to deal with this. It says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Now, if a soul is a ghost or a soul is a spiritual being and not a living being with a body, and it is what popular traditional Christianity believes, then how do you deal with this, this uh, scripture that says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die? When most people believe that uh, ghosts that go on to live in heaven or hell, they live forever in one of those two places. Not according to God. God says if it sins, it dies. That's because a soul is not a ghost. It's not a, a spiritual apparition that's liberated from the body at the point of death. It, the Bible doesn't communicate that. A soul is a living person. A soul is the combination of a physical body and the breath, the supernatural breath of life from God, the spirit of life. And when God gives that spirit of life, things happen. Amazing things happen. Life happens. So the soul that sinneth, well, that makes perfect sense because a living being, can they sin and can they die? Absolutely. And that's also consistent with Romans 6.23. Oh, by the way, what is, what is, uh, what's the most popular Bible verse in all the Bible say? What does it say? It says... For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not, what? Perish. But have, what's the opposite of perishing? Have everlasting life. You cannot say that a dead soul has everlasting life in hell because then that would still be granted, although a horrible situation, still be granted eternal life. That's not what the Bible teaches. It doesn't teach that a, a wicked, sinful person who does not accept Christ, who does not surrender to Christ, continues to have eternal life just in a worse place. It does not teach that. It teaches that there's one of two realities. Either you, you, you receive Christ, you serve Him, you love Him, you, you live for Him, and therefore you're granted the beautiful gift of eternal life in heaven, or the opposite of that is death or perishing. What does perishing mean? It means that once it is gone, once it has perished, once it's been destroyed, once destruction has been brought, once, it, once it's gone, it ceases to exist. That's the punishment. So do we go anywhere when we die? My goodness, let's answer that question. I think we've answered it very clear. But based on what we learn, if a soul is the combination of body and breath and that there's only a, such a thing as a living soul, then, then, okay, let's answer that. The soul is body and breath. The soul is a living being. I'm a soul, you're a soul. Remember when Paul wrote in the book of Acts, he was talking about how he was shipwrecked with you know, so, many, so many hundreds of souls. Was it a ghost ship he was, ship, he was shipwrecked with? No. Because Paul understood that a soul meant a living being. Living people with physical bodies who, who, who obviously are alive because they have the breath of life. And so the soul is a living person. What is a spirit? Well, it's interesting because technically a, a soul cannot exist without the spirit. The spirit is the breath of life, the supernatural breath of life that God gives that wakes a person up to live. So you have to have the spirit, which is breath, it's the breath of God, to be united with the body in order for that person to become a living soul. Now, based on the realities of that that we just studied in God's Word, let's ask the question, when a person dies, do they go somewhere? Well, let's go look here in Acts chapter 2. We give a clear answer from the example of David. That's King David. Now, let's take for a moment, let's use an illustration here. Let's say that the evangelicals or most Christianity today and what they believe about death is true. Let's say that when you die, your 
spiritual ghostly person inside you literally is liberated from the body and it floats up to heaven and it's with God. Now let's assume that's true for a moment. It's not, but we're using an illustration. Let's assume that's true. If you were to die today and you were to go to heaven, would you expect to see King David there? Many people would probably say, well, yeah, if that's the truth, then I would expect that when I get there, I would see King David there. Now, we're not trying to play judge or play God here. We're just simply using an illustration. David made a lot of bad choices. He made some mistakes, but yet he repented for those mistakes. And actually, God went on to describe him as a man after his own heart. David, although he made some mistakes, he was a righteous man. I expect that when I get to heaven, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to see King David. We're going to have some conversations. I'm going to get to question him about, bro, what was it like when you, when you faced Goliath? And what was it like when you're facing these armies and Saul and all of the challenges? Like, it's going to be cool to get to talk to King David. So I think most Christians would agree, again, not trying to play God here, but say that they by faith would expect King David to be in heaven. Now, with that truth, nearly 1,000 years after the brother had died, 1,000 years before Pentecost, Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts chapter 2, full of the Holy Spirit, having just received the Holy Spirit, he preaches a powerful gospel sermon. And what does he say in the midst of that sermon? Acts chapter 2 and verse 29, what does he say? Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. But what's amazing is you go down to verse 34 in that same chapter, and this is what he says. Again, you know that you can't twist this. You know that you can't turn this into something of what it's not. It's very clear what it says. He says here, for David is not ascended into the heavens. Did you catch that? Well, if, if David is not ascended into the heavens, then where is he? David, according to the Bible... When he died 1,000 years before this moment, David's breath, his life source, went back to God. That is the breath of life that does not contain intelligence and, and awareness and, 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 and mental clarity and, and all of that stuff. No, no, no. It's simply the life source that God gives to waken us and to cause us to live. That returned to God. But David's dead body was buried in a sepulcher and therefore David ceased to exist. David is not in heaven according to Scripture. Let me ask this question. Do those who continue to have conscious, do those who die continue to have conscious thoughts after death? Now I ask this question because again, many Christians today, as I clearly illustrated in the beginning of this presentation, many Christians today believe or have this idea that when a person dies, for instance, their loved one or their friend or someone they care about, when they die, well, they're not really dead. They're just alive in spirit form. And so, therefore, the idea behind this or the belief behind this is that when a person dies and they go on, that they're very much mentally aware that they are a spirit and that they are in heaven or they are with God. And notice this, and they'll even say things like, you know, I've had family members of mine, friends of mine who said, you know, you know after one of their loved ones or friends passed away, they said, you know, the other day I was, I was out walking in the park and I, you know, I, I just, I just was just taking some time to be with the Lord. And then all of a sudden, this warmth from the sun just kind of graced my cheek. And I felt a little gust of wind that just right across just through my hair. And I felt this, this unexplainable sense of peace that overcame me. And before you know it, I, well, I just knew that Mama was with me, watching over me. Now, I know I kind of put on the theatrics there a little bit, but not meaning to be disrespectful, simply communicating the realities of what some people believe. Many people have this idea that if mama is in heaven and mama's looking down on me or mama's watching over me or daddy's watching over me or brother's with me or my wife or my husband or whoever's with me, and I understand this is a very sensitive topic. I understand many people believe this because it brings them a sense of comfort. But my friends, do what you want to have comfort in a lie. It's not true. Do those who continue to, do those who die continue to have conscious thoughts after death? Let's let the Bible answer. I don't care what you've experienced or what you might think is true. I want to know what God believes is true, what God tells me is true. And right here in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 5, 6, and also verse 10, notice what it says. It says, For the living know that they shall die, 
but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. In other words, their memory is gone. They don't know anything. They don't memorize anything. They're not thinking about you. They're not seeing you because they have no memory. Why? Their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. So when you feel that breeze and you, 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 you feel that warmth and you mm, have this sense of, oh, mama's with me. No, mama's not with you. Why? Because the Bible says that those, those people have nothing else to do that is done under this sun after they perish. In fact, it goes on to say in verse 10, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. That's why years ago I used to love those movies. This was years ago when I didn't know the truth about this. I loved those movies where uh, Hollywood would portray, uh, you know, dead people who had, or people that had died, and then they go to heaven, they become an angel, you know. And then God sends them as an angel back down to this earth in a very physical form to communicate a message, to watch over, to protect, or to influence someone in some way. I've seen those movies a lot. You know, again, somebody dies, they go become an angel, then they come back as an angel and, and they're communicating. Well, that's an idea that the dead do not sleep, that the dead just move on in spiritual form and then God just redirects that spirit however which way he wants and that they have intelligence and they know. What's going on around them? That's not what the Bible teaches. Because it says right here in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10, it says, For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave where you go. In fact, notice what Job chapter 7, and verse 9 and 10 says. It is a, an example. You know, God often uses nature to describe the realities of the kingdom of God. He uses one right here. It says, as the cloud is consumed and vanished away. You know, there's times when you're driving down the road, you see a cloud. You know, you're driving. You see, look up, you see a nice big fluffy cloud. And it's like, oh, that beautiful little cloud. I like that little cloud. That's a, that's a pretty little cloud right there. I like that cloud. And then you, you turn, you know, you drive maybe a few more miles. And then you look back up in the direction of where that cloud was. And it's either changed shape, changed form, or that big fluffy cloud that was once there is no longer there. God uses that as an example of the human life. Notice what he says here. He says, as the cloud is consumed and vanished away, so he that goeth down into the grave shall come up no more. So those people who say, oh, I was visited by my dad last night. He came and visited me. Wait, 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 you're talking about your dad that died back in like 1979? Yeah, he's been dead, but his spirit came to me. Um, no, it didn't. <laughs> Not trying to be disrespectful. Not only is that crazy and scary and... Uh, the Bible makes it very clear that the dead... No, what does it say? It says, they shall come up no more. And it also goes on to say in verse 10, he shall return no more to his house. Neither shall his place know him anymore. Friends... So the question is, when I hear someone come to me and say, oh, you know, last night I received a, a visit from daddy and, and daddy, he came to me in spirit form. And I, I, I get the eebie-jeebies. That's a little, that's, that's just, it's kind of scary to me. Why? Not, I'm not scared in the sense that I, I'm, I'm scared in, in, uh, you know, in, 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 in fear. No, no, no. It's kind of weird because the Bible says that that's, if that's not real people because the dead sleep. So if someone came and visited them as their dad, who is that? Who, what was that? We're going to learn in part two that that was the power of demons. The devil, demons, having the power to work miracles, to disguise themselves as your loved ones. So accurately to make you think that that's exactly who you're talking to. Who you're conversating with, who you're visiting. Whew, it's scary. How did Jesus describe death? Shouldn't we all believe what Jesus taught about death? Notice what it says in John 11, verse 11. John 11, verse 11. It says, These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may wake him out of sleep. It's... <laughs> Jesus describes death as a sleep. In fact, it's interesting that his disciples actually thought that he was talking about taking a nap because it says here that the disciples said, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. That's verse 12 of John 11. Well, Jesus, if he's taking a nap, let that brother sleep. In fact, in the next verse, verse 13, it says, how be it, Jesus spake of his death. But they thought that he had spoken of taking a rest in sleep. 
Oh, Jesus, he, their brother's taking a nap. You know, he's been sick. He needs the rest. Why would we want to go back and wake their brother up? He's sick. He needs, he needs to sleep. He needs the rest. Jesus is like, no, no, no. <laughs> no, 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 no mistake. His brother's dead. And it actually says plainly in verse 14 of John chapter 11. It says, then Jesus said unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Jesus, the creator of the universe, how did he describe death? What did he believe is the truth about death? He likened it unto sleep. Now, my friends, let me ask you this. When you went to bed last night, I'm assuming you slept at some point. Maybe there's someone who hasn't. I don't know. But most people went to sleep last night. At what point when you fell asleep, did you realize you had fallen asleep? No, you didn't. At the point you fell asleep and, and, and dozed off, you didn't say to yourself, ooh, and take off. <gasps> oh, that's some good sleep we're getting. No, 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 you didn't do that. And during and the night when you were sleeping, at what point did you say, when you went into that real deep sleep, what point did you say to yourself, self, man, we sure are getting some good sleep. Oh, no, 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 you didn't say that either. You didn't plan your day tomorrow. You didn't plan your agenda. You didn't take down a grocery list in the middle of the night planning to go get groceries the next day. No, 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 no. You didn't even know you existed when you went to sleep. You see, that's how death is. It's almost like going under anesthesia for surgery. I've had surgeries before. And I'm sure many of you who are watching this, you've had surgeries. You go under that anesthesia. Let me tell you something. You start counting back, you know, five, four, three. Uh. Now, I know there's been some scary stories taught about, taught about what happens or told about what happens during surgery. But most people who go under anesthesia, they're not under anesthesia going, boy, I tell you what, look, whoo, look at this operating room. It's a nice operating room. Hey, nurse, how you doing? Hey, doc, be careful with that scalpel. No, 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 no. You wake up many hours later in a recovery room. You didn't even know you existed. That's how Jesus described death. Not as some ghostly spiritual experience beyond the grave. No, no, no. So my friends, this is part one. Part two is going to come soon. May not be next week, but stay tuned for 3 a.m. Because in part two, we're going to cover the many challenging texts. And we're going to revisit John chapter 11 and look at when Jesus called Lazarus death, you know, asleep. What did that mean? We're going to go a little deeper and we're going to take on the death challenge part two. I challenge you, my friends, study this out. Look at these passages again. Stop believing what everyone tells you and what everyone around you believes. Study it for yourself to be approved, to be assured that you believe in what the Bible teaches and what God says in his word. Until next time, God bless you all.